talk I'm about to give is an enhanced version of one that I gave off the cuff in this lodge about a year ago, having just read an article in an engineering journal, and it came up as historic, you know, does anyone have anything for education? And well, I had a thought. And uh, what I want to do is take a few threads and sort of bind them together into what I hope turns out to be a decent yarn. And uh, although some of it is quite speculative, most of what I'm going to refer to is a, is a matter of record. And it involves considering a few items, um, one of them being the state of Christianity in Europe in the 10th century, uh, the chemical and uh, mechanical properties of Roman concrete, opus cementium, and, and questions that are asked at the opening and closing of every Master Mason's Lodge. So, so the, first, the first item, the, the church was doing quite well a, in the later 10th century, you know, the year 1950 and onwards. Uh, things, things were going well. Uh, it had been building its strength slowly but steadily uh, ever since Christianity was decriminalized by Emperor Constantine in the 4th century. There had been a bit of a blip with the fall of Rome, but it was back on again. Um, the, the Celtic church was encountered uh, by missionaries heading north. They were surprised to find, yes, there are actually Christians still here. Uh, but they were sort of told, no, no, don't, don't be doing any proselytizing. We've got our own version. Grand Lodge, so to speak, have got their version that they want to carry to uh, Scandinavia and such. So they were doing quite well. And Europe in the main was governed by, um, by feudalism, which was the ultimate pyramid organization. You know, the king, right, at the, and then the senior nobles and the lessers and the yeomen. And when you got to the bottom, you had the peasantry. But right at the top end, of course, the, the kings and princes, they were they not governed, but they were on one with the church in many respects. So, you know, the church had its influence on the way that Europe was, was running. And uh, the and feudalism was augmented by... Um, Barbarity, superstition, and religion. The former augmented uh, very much by the latter. Uh, and the rendering of the church into two distinct parts was still about a hundred years away. And what I'm referring to there is not the Reformation, but the great schism between East and West Church when Rome and Constantinople said, no, no, we're doing things differently. And a line was drawn sort of north, south across Europe. Uh, but that was still, that, that had been fermenting for a couple of hundred years. Uh, and at that period, the predations of the Norsemen were easing off, uh, becoming less. They were, the, the Scandinavia was starting to become Christianized, uh, and they, they gained a lot of, they, they were being brought into the fold in a way. Uh, Parts of northern France had become essentially colonies of Norway and Denmark, Normandy. Uh, so they were, they were being brought in. A, because until that point, there hadn't been much point in building a large ecclesiastical infrastructure. If some ragged chap with horns in his hat was just going to come away and grab all, come along and grab all the good bits, because that's what had been going on. And there were, there were certainly concerns about what was happening south of the Mediterranean, uh, where Islam, another offshoot of Judaism, was on the rise, but it yet had to be seen how all that was going to play out. So all in all, things were, things were doing well. Uh, the downturn of European culture and civilization, which had followed the collapse of the Roman Empire, it had passed its nadir. Things were starting to get a little better, and with the um, development of commerce and the trades and professions, 
towns were starting to emerge from the wreckage that had been post-Roman Europe, uh, the leaders of the church could see that um, substantial and impressive buildings uh, were going to be required to house large congregations and uh, instill a sense of awe into the general population. And that was also part of the, the arrangement with the feudal system, with, with the kings, the people who actually ran the countries. It was, it was the church's responsibility to um, educate the people that things were good. Let's stick with what we have. The status quo is good. You were the king up there, but there were accepted truths that um, oh, if it's a bit right, life's a bit rough for you right now, don't you worry because there's an afterlife. As long as you stick by the rules, you're guaranteed pretty much eternal paradise. And remember this parable about the eye of the needle and the camel and such. You know, this is all going to be good. It's all going to work out. Anyway, I digress a little. So to this end, the end being large, impressive buildings, imagine... A, they're being gathered, architects, engineers, and builders in this very structure in the Pantheon in Rome. Now, the Pantheon had been built as a temple to the Roman gods, but it had become, had become a church in the year 1609. And so it was actually the principal church. There was a St. Peter's at the time, but this was the principal a religious building in Rome. And uh, and it was, it has the largest, most people know it's the, it was then and still is the largest unreinforced concrete dome at the time, and in fact, the largest one ever built. It's still there, that's what it looks like today. It's pretty impressive. That cannot be overstated how important concrete was to the Roman world. It uh, built the bridges and the aqueducts, and it built the harbors, uh, the temples and arenas, like it's all built out of, out of concrete. And the volcanic ash needed to produce it was uh, shipped around the Mediterranean. There was, uh, was concrete structures in uh, Lebanon that uh, were built from ash from southern Italy. Uh, and at the Pantheon, I like to imagine the question would have been asked, can you build something like this? And the answer had to be no. Because no one knew how to make concrete anymore. Opus cementium. Nobody knew how to do it. It had, it had been lost. But following the collapse of the empire, all infrastructure building, Bear in mind, these things were factory infrastructure, the bridges and the aqueducts and the harbors. It was what held the Roman Empire together. It was all concrete. So when the empire imploded, there were no more contracts. There was no call to build any of this. And within 100 years, the knowledge of how to do it was lost. It was gone. What could be done was build massive masonry walls there was starting to be some work in uh, military engineering, but massive masonry walls and massive masonry pillars, huge things. Um, and the spans were limited to Roman style arches that did not have the benefit of being built from stone clad concrete. So it was sort of limited what a, how big a span could be done. And you look at some of the the Euro early European cathedrals, and they're fairly narrow. You know, they'll have wings. They, and there are wonderful examples of what was done and could be done in the early cathedrals. Um, Durham Cathedral in England is just a wondrous thing, and Salamanca in Spain, and uh, Modena in, in Italy, and the Tower of London. Same sort of thing, massive masonry. Um, but it had its limitations. The uh, now a recipe for Roman concrete was 
Daggerville manuscripts in 1414. And I've often wondered, I tried to look into it and find out where it was found, and I suspect likely uh, the Vatican archives, because that's the greatest source of information there certainly was at that time, but I couldn't dig that out. Uh, but by that time, the cathedral builders had started to employ uh, the pointed or Islamic or Gothic arch. Instead of being this 180 degree thing, it was up and like this. And, uh, and it's the, and the knowledge of, I, the knowledge of the superior uh, load bearing and weight distribution capability of this type of arch was likely brought back to Europe by returning crusaders because it had been represented in, uh, in, in, in the Middle East for, for some time. And it's, it's interesting to consider. Uh, so, of course, the cathedrals after that start to go even higher and be grander and more airy and allow light in and more windows and such. It's interesting to consider the impact of those structures, what became known as Gothic cathedrals. Now, the style I was mentioning of the massive masonry pillars and walls, it's now known as, as a Romanesque style. That's just what it is. It's that type of architecture. But um, the newer stuff is called is Gothic, which was never actually intended to be a complementary phrase. Uh, it's interesting to consider the, the impact that these structures would have had on the towns and the surrounding countryside of the places it was chosen to build cathedrals. Um, early 14th century York, in England, which was the second city of England at the time, had a population of about 14,000. And Winchester, which also has an incredible cathedral at that time, was around 10,000. So if you can imagine an edifice covering a modern city block with a height ranging beyond 150 feet, being built in a town about half the size of Cranbrook. And when I say half the size, I'm talking population. Uh, footprint size is probably about 20% of Cranbrook. Can you can imagine this thing rising out of here. I mean, the, but the effect on the populace would just, would have been incredible. You see this thing from miles around. So what was found and discovered in 1414 was really just an ingredients list for, um, for Roman concrete. It didn't go into how to combine the ingredients of what the process was. And that only came about a couple of years ago when uh, work, extensive work was done by an MIT professor of civil and environmental engineering of the name of Admir Masik who prepared concrete using various types of lime and uh, several preparation methods and then rigorously testing the results. The volcanic ash from Pozzoli or something similar, quicklime, calcium oxide, that was the important ingredient uh, because it could be mixed hot. It heated up. Once water was added into quicklime, um, it heated up rapidly. So there were actually this Roman concrete, this stuff was mixed and placed at a temperature of about 70 degrees, made it very quick setting, and it gave interesting structural properties. And it contained these tiny sort of millimeter sized pieces of, um, of lime. And uh, early investigation of or investigators of Roman concrete uh, thought that this was just indicative of floppy mixing practices. But it turns out that these tiny little lime clasts stayed in there. And all concrete, as we know, cracks here. It all develops, all concrete develops microscopic cracks. And that's one of its weaknesses. It goes to become larger and it's a way for water to ingress. Well, when water ingresses, into opus cementium, it encounters these tiny little clasts of calcium oxide, and there develops a calcium saturated solution which actually repairs the crack. The Roman concrete is self repairing, 
that's why this thing's the hell is it? You know, it's about, it's seven no yeah seventeen hundred years old, and that picture was probably taken within the last decade. So it was just it's remarkable. A rudimentary form of concrete was developed in England in the late 18th century, but it wasn't until 1824 that Portland cement was invented by a Joseph Aspden, a Yorkshireman. Too bad that some of the folks from up, actually he was from Leeds. He was, a bricklayer, he was a bricklayer by trade, but he applied himself to making a better product and he invented Portland cement. And it was only with the invention of Portland cement that concrete has once again been able to serve humanity. Which brings us to the questions. So the worshipful master asks, why do you leave the east and go toward the west? And the junior warden replies, to seek for that which has been lost. Brethren, might it be that one of the genuine secrets of a master mason is how to make opus cementium? And that concludes my thing. There's lots of questions in there that, that arise out of it, but that was just, that was a question. I read this, and I made a copy of the article, which I'll leave out here for anybody who wants to get points off of it somewhere. Um, I'd read that article and went to lodge that evening. And I did, wow, this is really, this ties in somehow. I say it's speculative, but it's a good thing. Um, so that's essentially it. Um, hope it raises more questions, and uh, that's the whole idea. So thank you.